in the treatment planning process. Using a uh, OSHA approved marker to mark our gingiva and using our laser tip to ablate the soft tissues, bone sounding and then using our laser tip to do osseous recontouring and our full thickness flap to evaluate what is very, very rough and rugged bone removal with an osseous trough of almost two millimeters in this case. But what's more important, I think, here, as I showed that first case, is the buttressing bone we could never deal with with a closed flap approach. And oftentimes, that's really the key to making a beautiful full smile, where you look down the buccal corridors and you see the contours that you could appreciate from the gingival margin apically. Here we are recontouring our osseous troughs with a chisel tip. It takes a lot of time to do this, but wonderful tools uh, to remove the bone and, and not leave behind that same effect that a high-speed burr would. And here we see a three-year post-op. Once again, I'll point out that we, we didn't treatment plan this right. Nine should be a bit longer there. But a happy patient and certainly a nice outcome. I don't know that we could have managed this same outcome in the stability at three years without reflecting a full thickness flap. So these questions, is there sufficient tactile sensation transmitted through the laser tip to allow the condition to adequately distinguish between bone and root surface? Do the roots treated incur damage, creating ditching, charring, heat-induced cracking, or melting? In cases requiring bone removal, does lack of direct visualization allow the clinician to establish proper anatomical dimensions? Contours that will main, maintain papilla, the free gingival margin, and prevent a violation of biologic width. Where I think we need to go next is into a randomized controlled study to determine the safety and efficacy of flapless crown lengthening with osseous resection performed by the Urbinium YAG laser. This is a study we've had a protocol written for before the publication of the case series, and we had it all teed up ready to go until we lost funding from industry. This is a study, like so many others, that won't be done if we can't get the laser industry to buy in to the need for high evidence, not just with laser crown lengthening, but for all the applications of dental lasers and dentistry. We propose 25 patients, study design following randomization. The subjects will have excess gingival removed with the laser. Both sides will then undergo closed flap crown lengthening in an effort to provide a minimum of two millimeters above the osseous crest and below the newly created free gingival margin. A full thickness flap will then be elevated, randomized to only one side. The flap side will be assessed for osseous and root surface anomalies created by this laser and the osseous crest will be recontoured as necessary. Primary endpoint will be the stability of the health and the attachment apparatus from six weeks to six months, as measured by changes in crown length from six weeks to six months, and changes in inflammation scores from baseline to six months. Secondary endpoints will include changes in distance from the osseous crest to the stent immediately following surgery compared to sounding measurements at six months, Changes from baseline to six months from tip of the papilla to the stent. Aesthetic satisfaction through a visual analog score, baseline in six months. Proportion of subject with root cavitations and their influence on the gingival margin stability. Certainly pain and discomfort will be recorded from our patients. And change from baseline and probing depths, tooth mobility, sensitivity to percussion, pulp test, and width of the PDL, measured radiographically. We feel like it's a study such as this that's critical for us to emphasize predictability and stability, and have some sound basis from the evidence to confirm the validity of this treatment modality. I'll share with you a case recently completed with this protocol meaning that half is treated with well, the entire 
uh, maxillary arch from molar to molar is treated with a flapless approach, and then half of it is flapped for visualization and recontouring. We'll look at our video here, walking through first a surgical guide is used to, to place these bleeding points at the height of contour with a periodontal probe. The laser tip is utilized to perform our gingivectomy with almost an external beveled approach. And this is probably my favorite application of the laser in, adoles in adolescent patients is before we feel growth and development is complete and we don't really dare to alter their osseous crest levels, we perform a laser gingivectomy and they get immediate satisfaction with the understanding that as they get older, there may need to be some changes to the osseous crest. So gingivectomy, laser gingivectomy is a wonderful procedure to have in our hands. Uh, here you see a little laser gingivectomy around an implant that's already been placed in the number three position. We're finished with our gingivectomy now, and we're moving on to uh, a better understanding of where we want to place the crestal bone position, comparing our central incisors to our canines as far as tooth length, bone sounding, hard to see here, but we're bone sounding almost to the level of the osseous crest from the newly formed free gingival margin. using a Glickman elevator to kind of do that peekaboo approach so that you can have a little better access to the crestal bone. We've changed our laser settings now to a bone cutting uh, wavelength and adding water that's dispersed from the laser tip for cooling. We're trying to sound the bone with our laser tip and then back off half a millimeter to a millimeter and allow the laser to ablate the hard tissues. And you can see in that last little clip that we're, we're getting almost four millimeters of bone sounding from the free gingival margin. But back and forth, bone sounding, laser tip application. Again, this is a, it's a lengthy procedure compared to flap osseous crown lengthening. In this case, the laser crown lengthening part of it took 90 minutes. The other thing to look here is that, you know, if you're using your diode lasers, you expect some coagulation. With your binium YAG, you're not going to expect the same amount of coagulation. Uh, based on that medium, it's just not going to give you the coagulation that, that, a, that, a, that a diode laser will. There, I was going back with a curette just to try to clean out any small fragments that have, are left behind. And now we're moving on to a 15 blade to reflect the flap on the right side of this patient. using an ore band knife to assist with the beginning of our flap reflection, then up to a Glickman elevator. And introducing the Urbinium Yag laser tip to laser tip to do our bone recontouring. You see the very jagged edges of the bone that I left behind from the flapless approach. We're just coming back and modifying this as appropriate. If you look very closely, you'll see some vertical root grooves that I created, especially on this first bicuspid. And indeed, patience is a virtue when using the laser for hard tissue removal. That is the tooth that, if you evaluate very closely, there's some root grooves that I'll come back and root plane. Here we're making sure that we have an osseous crest level that's favorable. And it's a back and forth between measurements and sounding, coming back and repositioning our mucoperiosteal flap using a 5 in this case a 5 plain gut suture. From a standpoint of post-operative healing with lasers alone, there is very minimal swelling, uh, very minimal discomfort. 
So that is indeed one of the greatest attributes to utilizing the laser is the patient feedback on their experience um, with the closed flap approach. In this patient, there was really no distinguishable difference on what she felt between the laser and flapped side. And of course, the one thing that is always a little bit unnerving is what's going to happen with our flap during the healing process? Is it going to be mobilized by swelling or mastication of food? Uh, that's one thing that when we talk about crown lengthening at times, if we have a thin periodontal biotype, we do our osseous crown lengthening and then perform our gingivectomy at a later date. So we have better control over the position of the free gingival margin. The biggest use of the laser in our practice today on an everyday basis is the touch-up procedure at six to eight weeks. Coming back and doing a touch-up of the soft tissues with the laser, minimal discomfort, minimal bleeding, and we're usually switching from a rubinium YAG to a diode laser to perform that soft tissue recontouring after the initial healing stage. Here we see the day of surgery. That is the non-flapped side, right to left. This is at two weeks. Certainly, inflammation is comparable between right and left. Here we're looking at six weeks. Still inflammation of the papillary tissue. Full smile. And a very satisfactory outcome in both right to left. This is where the research needs to be done still. This is where we really need to look at where a patient's going to be at three years and, and after. What we're doing to these patients in our chairs, it's really important to know where they're going to be long term. All of you as restorative dentists and myself as a periodontist, we want our patients to come back and see us forever, hopefully. I mean, that's why we got into this. We build relationships with our patients. We want them to be happy. We want them to trust us. And they, they expect us to understand the evidence base when it comes to treatment. So although I am a huge supporter of laser therapy, there's a lack of evidence, in my opinion, on most procedures involving lasers. There are tons of case reports, great case series. But what we need next is randomized controlled clinical trials to have an evidence base to support our decision making in all of these different laser applications. Here, if you look closely at eight months, you will see some inflammation returning at the free gingival margin. Is this associated with our procedures, or is it just poor plaque control? Certainly, from central to central, there's that bit of gingival inflammation that should be easily addressed with hygiene techniques via flossing or rubber tip application. But so far, as we compare from two weeks to eight months in this patient, both right and left had gingival margin stability, papilla stability, within a half a millimeter. So, so far, we're intrigued by the fact that the laser flapless treated side is not showing a significant tissue rebound or significant inflammation as you look at that upper left quadrant. So our answers to the questions proposed, is there su sufficient tactile sensation transmitted through the laser tip to allow the clinician to adequately distinguish between bone and root surface? Yes, we can feel the bone adequately, but when it comes to the second question, do the roots treated incur damage, cratering, ditching, charring, heat-induced cracking or melting? Occasionally, and in this case series, seven of nine experience some damage to the root surface. If so, can a technique be developed to prevent root damage? In our opinion, so far, this technique involves a, a, a minimal flap, meaning that we use something like that Glickman elevator to reflect the free gingival margin 
without any reflection of the papilla, to give us a little bit of access to those thick bone patients where we have to move the, move the laser tip buccally to deal with thick buttressing bone. The problem is all that buttressing bone further apically can't be dealt with with a laser. So if you have the cases that show that almost wings of buttressing bone, the laser is probably not your best technique to have the outcome that the patient is going to desire from an aesthetic standpoint and full smile. In cases requiring bone removal, does lack of direct visualization allow the clinician to establish proper anatomical dimensions and contours that will maintain papilla and gingival margin post-surgically and prevent violation of the biologic width? Doubtful. And this is the, the arena where if you've got the tough case that's going to involve redoing restorations that were in violation of biologic width, they're going to be put in provisionals that will accumulate more plaque and introduce more inflammation into the site. Laser crown lengthening may be a limitation there where we're not going to have as much control over establishing a healthy biologic width in a patient that shows they're influenced by violating their biologic width. And if not, if we can't control crown length, excuse me, biologic width, which cases should be treated with closed flap crown lengthening? And so far, I don't know that we have a true answer, but it would reason that the thin periodontal biotype patient is the one we would select a laser for because when we reflect some of those cases, we are setting that patient up for potential recession at a later date. If we could leave the soft tissues intact and successfully remove that thin bone with a laser tip, these patients would likely be uh, the most likely, the, the best candidates for a closed flap approach. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I would like to uh, thank the committee for asking me to come share this topic with you. And I only hope that in the future we can come back and give you some more evidence based on controlled clinical trials. Thank you for your attention.